A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. In the 20 years I was an FBI agent, I was lucky to have been a part of some very high-profile investigations, such as the Tylenol murders and the Unabomber. We have covered some of those stories and will continue to cover them in Killer Psyche. But there are some cases I work that were not a life-and-death situation, and some of those cases proved to be the most fun to work on. The story I'm going to tell you over the next two episodes is a long one, I know, and a bit crazy, but trust me, it pays off. You will get to hear lots of behind-the-scenes details, and it is truly one of my favorite FBI stories. In order for it all to make sense, I need to put it into context first. So grab a cup of coffee, a glass of wine, or even the whole bottle and settle in to find out how I, Candace DeLong, became a madam for the FBI. When we think of sports stories, we tend to think of tales of epic on-the-field glory or incredible against-all-odds comeback stories. But the new podcast, Sports Explains the World, brings you some of the wildest and most surprising sports stories you've never heard. Listen to Sports Explains the World on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. Our newest season looks at the tragedy in Jonestown. Jim Jones had earned a large following for his politically progressive church, but facing charges of abuse, Jones led his followers to perform the unthinkable. Listen to American Scandal on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is The Candy Store, Part 1. Okay, guys, it is Candace DeLong story time. And I think you got... (laughs) (laughs) And last time we had a great story about Candace's first time undercover. And now I'm going to have her tell you a little bit about when she was assigned to an FBI drug squad and they were working with the DEA. So, Candace, when did you start working on the drug squad and what does that mean? I was about nine years into my FBI career and the FBI was getting into the drug business prior to the mid 80s. The only agencies, federal agencies working drugs was pretty much the Drug Enforcement Administration. However, that changed and the Chicago Division of the FBI created two drug squads. Now, there were some DEA agents assigned to work with us and there were some FBI agents assigned to work in the DEA office. Did you like working on the drug squad? First, when I heard I was assigned to drugs, I was not happy. But it wasn't long before I thought, oh, my gosh, this is the most fun I've had in years. Working with the DEA is, it's, if you want to run around kicking ass and taking names, as they say, that's the squad to do it. There's always something going on, and nothing is more fun than working with DEA agents. They're cowboys. They're fun. 
you know, I, I, I don't want to say FBI agents aren't fun, but a lot of them are kind of stiff and starchy, and that is not the case with Drug Enforcement Administration agents. Well, I worked on a show with the Meth Task Force, and I think Cowboy is, is a great description. They were a lot of fun. I mean, the subject matter, not so much. But one of the other things they did was they took me to a warehouse where it was full of cars and art that they had confiscated. It was, it was crazy. Yeah, the way that that comes about, it's not that the FBI or the DEA buys cars. They don't have to. The Drug Enforcement Agency, I think their budget is upwards of $3 million, $3 billion with a B. And they are the only federal law enforcement agency that pays for itself. The taxpayers do not support the Drug Enforcement Administration. So then where do they get their money? They get their money from cash and property that they seized that was obtained as a result of illegal activity. For example, let's say a dealer is busted and he is driving a expensive car, lives in a gazillion dollar house, but he has no source of income, no visible source of income, hasn't paid taxes in years. And he has no explanation as to where he got the money to buy these things, these toys that criminals buy. Then the government can seize the property. If there's a trunk load of cash under his bed or all over his car, you know, hidden all over his car, that can be seized by the government. Now, the individual is given an opportunity to explain where it came from. I'll have to go into court and testify that it is his, that it was legally obtained, and then he would get his stuff back if he could prove it. But Julie, more often than not, they don't even show up to court, forfeiture court. Why? Exactly because they would have to testify under oath, and they would have to prove, the burden of proof is on them, not the government. They would have to show proof that, okay, I won the lottery last year. See this ticket, $5 million, that's where I got the money from, that's how I bought the house, that's how I bought the expensive car, and then he'd get his stuff back. But usually they don't even show up. Well, that's a civil court, not a criminal court, correct? Absolutely. So did you benefit from that at all? I did. I did. In 1988, my bureau car, what I mean by that is the car that was assigned to me, Candace DeLong, My car was a brand new, top-of-the-line Mercury station wagon, and it was loaded with all the bells and whistles and and accessories. And, you know, say a station wagon, why would a drug dealer have a station wagon? Doesn't seem right. Doesn't seem to fit. Well, this drug dealer bought it for his wife, and he put it in her name. Because he thought, well, she's not involved in any drug activity. She, she'll be fine. And the feds cannot seize the car if anything happens. And Julie, I'm here to tell you, he was wrong. It seems like it. you were <laughs> driving the car. <laughs> <laughs> why is that? Can you explain to everybody why that's wrong? I believe that's something about ill-gotten gains. Oh, Am I correct? Ill-gotten gains, yes. Ill-gotten gains is a legal term, and then basically it applies to if someone obtains money illegally, then the proceeds from the illegal activity, such as drug dealing or maybe running a prostitution ring or fraud of some kind, that can be seized by the government. Any cash, property, things like that running a financial scam, fraud, obtaining money through robbing a bank. Those are illegal activities. And because the individual has the money, they don't get to keep it. Seems like, though, you kind of pulled the short straw. No offense to the Mercury station wagons of, of, (laughs) you know, the 1980s, but that doesn't really seem your speed. Well, actually, I lived in the suburbs. I even went to a Salvation Army and I got a child's car seat and I put it in the back seat of the station wagon so that it would look even more 
like whoever was driving it, oh my gosh, that's just a woman in a station wagon. Obviously, she's got a car seat, so she must have kids. No one would suspect I was actually an FBI agent assigned to a drug squad. So it's kind of a little bit like undercover work. Did you ever get to be something else undercover? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we talked about that in a previous episode. But working drugs, you could end up going undercover pretty quickly, depending on the situation that was popping up. But circling back to my suburban mom station wagon, that wasn't the only car that I was able to drive that was seized in a drug deal. One day, my supervisor, Elaine, called me into her office and handed me a set of keys and said, here's your new undercover car, and it's down in the garage. Take good care of it. It was a brand new, bright and shiny, flaming red Ferrari. Ah, uh, that's a Candace car. Yeah. Definitely a Candace yeah. car. How did they get a Ferrari? <laughs> I couldn't stop smiling. Well, here's how it came about. The owner of the car was a drug dealer, and he was arrested, and the car was seized. But we had to find evidence in the car that would allow us to keep it, to seize it. So this particular drug dealer was, the inside of that car, Julie, was immaculate. There wasn't even a speck of dust anywhere. We couldn't find any drugs or the presence of drugs. The agent in charge of that called the FBI lab, and they suggested that we vacuum the car with a dust buster lined with a coffee filter. So we did. And sure enough, the filter was soaking with cocaine. I loved driving that car. I'm sure you did. So, Candace, you were working with the DEA and you were getting to drive some really fun cars. You went from a top of the line station wagon to a Ferrari. I'm assuming you had to go back to the station wagon. Am I right? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Was there ever a time when you were driving one of those cars and the owner that you confiscated it from or the FBI confiscated it from, they said to you, hey, that's my car, that's my stuff? Yeah, there was one time that happened. One day, we seized a brand new black Ford Bronco. And, well, it had been doing double duty as a drug mobile. A woman that I worked with on our squad, her name was Mary, and she was the forfeiture clerk for the entire office. You see, it wasn't just drug squads that seized cash and properties. Like I said, cash and property from any ill-gotten gain is fair game for the feds. So she was very busy. She and I went down to the Chicago Police Department impound lot to do the paperwork to get the Ford Bronco. We were almost finished and ready to leave when the previous owner, who was a thug and he had two huge bodyguards with him, showed up and started harassing us. As I recall, the guy said to me, who the hell do you bitches think you are? I told him we were with the FBI and subsequent to federal forfeiture laws, we were relieving him of his car. I remember he said to me, I never heard of no forfeiture laws. I just said, hey, buddy, call your lawyer. You made your own bad luck. But he didn't back off. He continued to badger us we were walking to our car, and he was all puffed up and angry and calling me names. And I thought, <laughs> I remember he said I had a bony ass, which was pretty funny. But I always had to laugh when bad guys would call me names because, Julie, for the 10 years I was in clinical psychiatric nursing and working in maximum security, I got called some of the most horrible things you can imagine. And nobody, no bad guy has ever been able to outdo things that my patients called me. Were you able to say anything back to him? I mean, could you say anything back oh, to him? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, you have to remain professional. 
of course, as we drove out of the lot, I admit I got a little not quite professional and I blew him a kiss as we drove off. (laughs) Well, you didn't say anything bad to him. See, it could have been mistaken for a nice gesture. Actually, Mary, the woman I was with, we were both laughing and she was kind of hustling me out to the station wagon before my mouth. As I used to say, my mouth wrote a check that my badge could not cash. But you know what? You got to have fun with the job, Julie. And it was fun. Okay. So this is, I believe, the part in the story that I wanted to get to. It's a little naughty. So if you have any littles around, please plug their ears up or actually just send them out of the room because plugging their ears probably won't help. So Candace. Let's continue on. You had left the lot, and what happened? Okay, Mary and I were in the car. I was driving, and we were, there's a major, major thoroughfare in Chicago. It's called Lakeshore Drive. So we're going up Lakeshore Drive, and we heard a voice, a male voice, somewhere in the car. We heard, and the voice said, and I'm not kidding you. I want to eat your pussy. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, that's a big oh, dear. I couldn't believe my ears. Mary heard it, too, and we both whipped around to check the back seat. It, it was empty. And I, I remember saying, what the hell? And then we heard the voice again. This time, he said, I want to fuck you all night. And I have to say, for a moment, we panicked. Like, what the heck is this? May, did, that drug dealer that we were being harassed by, had, had he figured out some way to get in our car to booby trap it, some kind of revenge thing? I was just about to pull over when the voice said, I want to fuck your eyeballs out. Oh, God. Okay, so everybody out there in Killer Psyche Land, that is something that someone else said. We chose to quote it. Don't leave us now. Yes. <laughs> go ahead, Candace. <laughs> yeah, don't go away. The story gets better. That was when Mary and I realized that the voice was coming from our car's two-way radio speaker under the front seat. All bureau cars have one. It's so the agents can maintain contact with other agents they're working with while they're in their vehicles and maintain contact with the office. But here's the thing. The FBI had its own special radio frequency, and no agent would dare use such language on the air. In fact, it would have been a violation of Federal Communication Commission's rules, FCC, and not to mention the FBI's rules and regulations. If an agent talked that way on a two-way radio, I think they'd never be seen again. (laughs) <laughs> their desk would be cleaned out. They'd be escorted from the office. It was real severe. You did not swear on the radio. I was wondering where in the world the office dispatcher was. She's the woman who was in the downtown office manning the FBI radio switchboard. It was unusual. I wasn't hearing her voice on the radio at all. The only other explanation was that someone was broadcasting from one of the Chicago division's handy talkies, or HTs, as we called them, one of our handheld portable radios. And that person's voice was what we were hearing in our car. So what is a handy talkie? Is that like a walkie-talkie? Yes, it is. A handy talkie is about the size of a pencil box. And they are very, very expensive, probably about my annual salary back in 1987. Agents were mandated to very carefully safeguard them at all times. I remember when I was oriented to one that I was given, and I was told I either had to keep it with me at all times or secured in the trunk of my bureau car with a lock and chain. Wow, that's that's pretty intense. Yeah, yeah, it was. Julie, I don't think the tomb 
of Tutankhamun was guarded more safely than (laughs) what was required of an FBI handy talkie. But here's the thing. So as you can imagine, no one would ever leave a handy talkie lying around where someone might make off with it. Well, obviously someone did. There is at least one walkie-talkie or handy-talkie in someone's hands that's not supposed to be. Yeah, the wrong hands. I'm assuming other people were hearing that. Were they trying to take care of it? Well, the radio switchboard operator, her name was Lynn, as I recall. And I heard her voice, which was not unusual. For example, if I wanted to communicate with the office, I might say, not my name, by the way, usually a number, so-and-so to headquarters. I am about to enter the building with the prisoner. Please have agents meet me down at the loading dock. But I didn't hear any other agents talking to Lynn. I just heard her voice. And what I heard her say was, what's your name? Agents, when you're on the radio, you don't use your name or any identifying factors. It's usually the squad that you're on has a number and then some other identifier that only your squad mates would know. Well, if if she said, what's your name, then I'm wondering if that was the signal to everybody that something was wrong. Uh, Obviously, when someone said the things that the guy said, there was something wrong. There was something wrong, right. Yeah, (laughs) there was something wrong. But could everyone in the FBI hear it? Anyone listening to a radio, yes. And obviously, she was trying to communicate with whoever had our handy talkie. Did the guy know that he was on an FBI frequency? Oh, no. We assumed that he didn't know because, well, for one thing, he's got a very expensive piece of equipment that belongs to the federal government and in particular, a law enforcement agency, the FBI. We just assumed, I assumed, and I think everybody else, he had no idea that he was on what he had in his hands. And we didn't want to tip him off that the entire Chicago division of the FBI was listening. Well, at least he had a big audience. I mean, (laughs) he seemed like he wanted attention. Yes. So you're in the car, you're coming from the impound lot, And you hear this very eloquent man on the handy talkie saying lovely things. What happened? Did you go back to the headquarters or how did you guys figure it out? Yeah, I got right back to the office and I just kind of bolted into the radio room and I was kind of surprised. I thought I would see somebody, an administrator or something there coaching Lynn. But instead, the radio room, which is about the size of maybe. Uh, 12 by 12 room. And there were guys, male agents all over the place, and they were just laughing at what they were hearing on the radio. So they weren't helpful at all. Not exactly. Nobody was trying to coach Lynn through this situation. And I really felt bad for her. She had a look on her face that of like, oh, please get me out of here. This is not in my job description. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Did he keep talking or was there just radio silence? Oh, yeah. He kept talking and the guys were laughing. I mean, the guy was just a potty mouth. And it was, well, it was kind of funny. Does anyone step in and say, this is what we should do? I'm No. I I feel so bad for your friend Lynn. I'm just like, someone help her. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was surprised that nobody was there. I mean, it was funny. It did seem like a joke, but it was no joke. And Lynn, Lynn was just trying to keep him talking and maybe hope that he did something stupid that would reveal some information that we could use. But he was too smart, it seems, to call from a subway or a train station where the background noise would have tipped us off to maybe where he was. But we weren't getting any information like that from his transmissions. And why wasn't there someone there that was taking charge of things? Well, that's a heck of a good question, (laughs) but but that's where the story comes from. Here's the thing. This, This kind of thing, a situation like this, the term is career buster. It had career buster all over it. Why a career buster? What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, 
like everything else in life, there's politics involved. If somebody took charge and it blew up and resulted in exposing the Bureau to public ridicule, anybody linked to it would become the sacrificial lamb. And since there was nothing tangible at stake, like somebody's life, for example, everyone could justify backing into the shadows. Like, who, me? I didn't have anything to do with it. It was him or it was her. Well, I know you don't stand around and wait. I'm, well, I'm assuming you went and took charge of the situation. Yeah, call me crazy, but I had a brainstorm. I had an idea, but I knew that my supervisor at the time, he was just too much of what I call a company man to let me try out what I was thinking. There's an expression in the Bureau, if you want to do something with certain supervisors, it might be better to ask forgiveness after it goes south than ask permission. I think you followed that a lot, Candace. I'm just going to say it wasn't just in the Bureau. (laughs) Okay, yes, yes. My Catholic schoolgirl upbringing, just do it and worry about getting in trouble later. Nevertheless, I wanted some kind of official blessing before I put my head on the chopping block. So I sought out one of our ASAC, Assistant Special Agent in Charge, Lane Crocker. We called him the Crocodile. He was one of the best managers, one of my favorite managers in my 20 years of the FBI. He was personable. He was creative. It was really dynamic. He actually knew most of the division employees by name, and that's 450 of us. Oh, and he had this incredible shock of white hair. He always reminded me of Santa, except he was six foot three and trim. And here's the thing about Lane that I really liked. He was not afraid to make decisions. And that's exactly what I needed. I literally ran up to his office. He was on the floor above me. And I, I went in and I found another agent that I was friends with. His name was Ron. And he was one of my favorite agents in the division. He was already in Lane's office discussing the radio problem. We all agreed the longer it went on, the more likely it was the press would get a hold of it with potentially humiliating results for us. Did they know how this happened? Yeah, yeah. They told me exactly when and how it happened. Some agent had left his handy talkie in his bureau car overnight. Ooh, he's going to be in trouble. Well, if you're going to leave it in your car, which is a mistake, it had to be under a lock and a chain if it's in your trunk. But he didn't park his car in a garage. He left it overnight on the streets of Lincoln Park. He assumed it would be safe there. But when he woke up the next morning, went out to his car, he found it stripped of everything bad guys could sell, including thousands of dollars worth of FBI camera equipment. Oh. Yeah. If he was in hot water already, he was probably... The water is probably boiling then. Yeah, all I, all I could think of, I rolled my eyes and I just thought I wouldn't want to be in his pantyhose. Oh my gosh. But in the meantime, we had to figure out the solution to the problem. You had a plan. So I what had was a plan. plan. Nobody else did. And, and I told Lane and Ron, I said, look, my plan is simple. All he wants to talk about is sex. If he wanted money, this is how it seemed to me anyway, if he wanted money, He'd be trying to sell us the radio, of course, not knowing who us really was. So I thought, I said, let's trap him in his own game. If it's sex he wants, let's give it to him. Oi, Candace, I'm sure that (laughs) raised some alarms. It did. It did. I thought Lane's eyeballs were going to pop right out of his head, as did Ron. They both looked at me slack-jawed. So I thought, okay, I have to fill them in here. This is what I told them my plan was. I would broadcast on the radio from the office. Of course, the bad guy wouldn't know that. 
and I would pose as a madam of a prostitution ring. I would pretend that one of my girls had left the handy talkie, my handy talkie, in her car trunk, the car that he had robbed. I would tell him that the radio had a special, and I just made this up on the fly, police free frequency. And it seemed to me that he was unsophisticated enough to buy that. And then I would tell him I needed my radio back and I would pay for it. At this point, Lane and Ron were leaning into me. I definitely had their attention. So then I told him that I would set up a meeting with the guy, the thief, to conduct the exchange. And at that point, There'd be FBI agents hiding all around, and they would rush in and grab him and put the handcuffs on him, all nice and cozy, and we'd get our stuff back, and everybody could go home. That was the plan. But things don't always go as planned, do they? No, they don't. Running an FBI call girl ring is not as easy as you'd think. But... You'll have to wait till next week's episode to hear all about Madam Candace and her girls. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at Wondery.com slash survey. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Story research and additional writing by Ann Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Senior audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Lindsay Whistler, Colin Modell, and Jada Williams are production assistants. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Joaquin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Tree Fort and Marshall Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Tree Fort Media. Wondery.